Every day around 1.15, Qatar Airways Flight 921 departs Auckland for Doha. Once airborne, a dispatcher at Qatar's operations center in Doha monitors its speed, altitude, and position to avoid turbulence, bypass storms, and optimize fuel burn with favorable winds. While most flights have one dedicated dispatcher, ultra-long-haul flights over 16 hours are often handed off between up to three qualified international dispatchers across shifts, ensuring continuous monitoring of global weather and airspace changes. With flights lasting so many hours, the risk of medical issues increases. To prepare, aircraft are equipped with advanced medical kits, automated external defibrillators or AEDs, and often have access to med air or similar telemedicine services, which allows pilots to consult with doctors mid-flight. Dispatchers then work closely with pilots to determine the best diversion airports based on passenger needs and available medical facilities. Dispatchers, in coordination with the airline's crew scheduling team, ensures that the flight crew is within the legal requirement for rest. This includes specific times of the flight and areas separate from the cabin where the crew can sleep. On Qatar Flight 921, for example, two sets of pilots are used, including two captains and two first officers. Once the plane reaches cruising altitude, the first pair goes to rest, while the second pair takes control until the second half of the flight. Meanwhile, on even longer flights, like Singapore's from New York to Singapore, there are about 13 flight attendants, about one for every 12 passengers, who alternate every few hours between service and the crew bunk. Speaking of flights like New York to Singapore, it often passes over the North Pole or near it when flown directly, which requires special protocols. Traditional VHF, or very high frequency radio communication, is limited in the Arctic, so aircraft rely on other communication methods like HF or high frequency radios, or satellite communication based radio, or SATCOM, for real time location tracking and communication with the ground and air traffic control. The FAA mandates that for routes going to and from the US on polar routes, that there are two cold weather anti-exposure suits in case the plane has to divert and communication needs to take place outside to coordinate the next steps. Although options in that region of the world are quite sparse. While planes like Boeing's 777-200LR and Airbus's A380, the world's largest passenger plane, operate some of the world's longest flights, like San Francisco to Delhi or Auckland to Dubai, most of the world's current or planned longest flights are operated by just two aircraft types. The first being the Airbus A350, with the smaller variant, the A350-900, offering about 8,100 nautical miles or 15,000 nautical kilometers in a standard configuration of about 300 or so seats, or the A350-900 ULR, only seven of which have currently been made, only for Singapore Airlines, used specifically on their flights to New York, which comes with an incredible 9,700 nautical miles of range or 18,000 kilometers or the larger A350-1000, which comes with about 8,000 nautical miles of range, or 15,000 nautical kilometers, in a typical 325-seat configuration. Then there's also the smaller 787 Dreamliner, specifically with the 787-9, the longest range Dreamliner out there, with about 7,600 nautical miles of range, or 14,000 nautical kilometers when flown with about 300 seats. As a result, the 787-9 can typically be found on more niche routes with less demand like Perth to London, Paris, or Rome, or Auckland to New York. These routes, while still long, 
require less range and fuel than the bigger A350. Where the A350 will fly on routes like Auckland to Doha instead, connecting passengers at Qatar Airways Global Hub at Hamad International Airport, from Auckland to places like London, a common onward destination for New Zealanders, or from big cities to big cities, economic centers like Singapore to New York, or with the world's next current planned longest route, Sydney to London and New York, with Qantas, Australia's primary international airline. Both aircraft feature lower cabin altitudes at 6,000 feet compared to 8,000 or more on older generation aircraft. On top of having sophisticated mood lighting on board and advanced air filtration systems to avoid sickness. This was a problem that older generation planes like the Airbus A340 had when they flew on New York to Singapore flights. The A350, as it offers more space, allows airlines like Qantas to offer wellness lounges while enhancing service with the wider cabin and wider seat pitch. The A350 can offer up to 343 seating, 10 seats per row in economy, but for ultra long haul routes to ensure comfort, Airlines typically only offer 333 seating. Both of these planes also require ETOPS or extended range twin engine operational performance standards, a certification to operate ultra long haul flights over remote areas. This certification allows aircraft like the A350 or 787 to fly over remote areas even on one engine multiple hours away from the nearest diversion airport. But there are a few other requirements to achieve ETOPS. There needs to be continuous engine monitoring with enhanced maintenance protocols to ensure engine safety, where issues also have to be detected early. The A350 can have ETOPS of up to 370 minutes, meaning it can fly about six hours without needing to divert. The 787 has about 330 minutes, meaning both of these planes can pretty much fly anywhere in the world, with the exception of a central route over Antarctica, although no commercial flight really requires that. Despite the incredible capabilities of both aircraft, both face challenges such as airspace restrictions. The flight from New York to Singapore, while the shortest Great Circle route would have the plane fly to the North Pole, then to Russia and China, because of airspace restrictions, that flight first flies over Europe, then the Middle East and India, taking significantly longer. As of 2025, Delta's flight from Detroit to Shanghai is the only U.S. operated flight to China east of the Mississippi River, where in 2019 there were about eight flights east of the Mississippi that flew directly to China from the U.S. As more direct routes to China require some overflight over Russian airspace. While some ultra long haul routes like New York to Bangkok with Thai Airways have yet to come back, even though Thai Airways has the A350-900 as well, although not the ULR variant that Singapore Airlines has, although they could order it, those routes have yet to return. The reason that routes like that ended was primarily because in 2008, fuel prices went up to $4 a gallon, or about a dollar per liter, something that is still largely seen today in the 2020s. For a lot of these ultra long haul routes to remain viable, they rely on premium high paying passengers on routes like New York to Singapore and Sydney to London, where there are a lot less seats than an A350 can typically handle. So if demand does get soft as it 
can in recessions. These planes, the A350 and 787, are versatile, meaning that if a route like Auckland to Doha, if that gets soft or if there's a border restriction as that happened in 2020, then pretty much within hours, airlines like Qatar Airways can pivot the aircraft in other directions. Looking ahead, it seems like the A350 will dominate the world's longest flights while the 787 is runners up, but the Boeing 777X specifically with the smaller 7788 will offer Airbus some competition. For now, the A350 wins, which doesn't only include the world's next longest flights like Sydney to London or New York, but also potentially even longer flights like Istanbul to New Zealand.